Uh, up to now, we looked at the main features of antennas. Uh, we looked, we went through the design of suitable antennas for our radio links. Uh, we analyzed the propagation of the radio signal, both due to obstacles, uh, due to unexpected, unwanted reflections, uh, especially off the ground. Uh, we looked at weather effects, but uh, now we came to the point where we have to design a certain radio link. And we have to think what to do here now. So designing a radio link, uh, we, out, out of our calculations we may get a signal level, a certain figure. We can adjust our receiver for that level, but that's not going to be stable. Because uh, propagation is changing all of the time, for many reasons. And the simplest uh, explanation with this, this such effect were noticed, were noticed in links through the ionosphere. This is also quite old radio communication dating back to the Second World War and even earlier. So we have an ionospheric layer at a certain height above ground. Uh, but now this ionosphere is changing all of the time. It's certainly the most noticeable variation is uh, uh, daily variation. So the urnar variation uh, of the ionosphere. So at night we have 10 times less electrons in the ionosphere. At night we do not have the lower lens in still dense uh, air with lots of neut neutron mole molecules that actually uh, attenuate our radio signal. So uh, the ionosphere is changing. Uh, not just over time, but also for other reasons. Uh, if we have two users, <coughs> let it be transmitter and receiver on the earth. Uh, we may have different links over the ionosphere. We may have just one hop over the ionosphere where I have refraction here. Uh, but uh, between the same two stations, I may have also other useful paths to the ionosphere, say a double hop path. Now we are getting the same, the same signal through two different paths, so I have the problem of multipath. Uh, what are the differences, what are the figures here in uh, an ionospheric connections? Uh, the differences here is that uh, uh, Lengths may differ, so if this was L1 of one hop, uh, if this was L2 of two hops. So the path difference delta L, so this is say L2 minus L1, is maybe in the range of 300 kilometers. Uh, so this difference is much. Uh, uh, this difference is much uh, larger than the wavelength. The wavelength we are using for ionospheric connections, the one like I drew here, uh, the frequency of the link is in the range of 10 megahertz. So the wavelength is in the range of 30 meters. So this thing is much, much larger than the wavelength. Whatever is changing 
say in the height of the ionosphere, at what height is the ionosphere actually happening? H. Whatever is changing here, say during day and night there is some change. So this thing is, these things are moving. So whatever this uh, here is moving, it's going to, to quickly run over all possible phase angles between ray 1 and ray 2. All, all possible combinations because this path difference 300 kilometers is much larger than, uh, than the 30 meters of the ionospheric range. And these differences may cause a fading. Uh, so if I uh, look here at the... with a period of a few minutes. So a few minutes, it's not practical now to change the frequency of our radio sets. Uh, you can uh, still live with this, but uh, you, you should understand that within a few minutes, a signal may disappear, may reappear again, may become much stronger. So this is now our fading, signal fading, what I'm talking about here. Also, the delay here, from these 300 kilometers, the delay is about, uh, so delta t, is around one millisecond. What does that mean? That means that uh, if I'm going to use any numerical transmissions over the ionosphere, uh, the symbol time, this should be much smaller than the uh, time of one symbol I'm using for numerical I'm using for numerical transmission. And the symbol time, therefore, has to be larger, say, than 10 times this value, 10 milliseconds. What this means, means that the symbol rate we have here, uh, that's 1 over t symbol. The symbol rate uh, can be, has to be smaller than about 100 symbols. per second. And this is quite a low signaling rate. Uh, if I do some examples here, what is 100 symbols per second? I didn't say bits per second because symbols can carry more than one bit of information. But uh, what, is, uh, what does that mean for communication over the ionosphere? Uh, if we have some kind of uh, digital communication over the ionosphere, uh, what uh, amount of symbols do we have? Uh, if we have hand coded, so hand, uh, an operator using his hand to key on a telegrapher key. And on the other side of the link, we have an operator listening to the received signal. That's about 10 symbols per second. 10, sim 10, 10 bits per second, uh, 10 basic symbols per second. And this can still work. If we go to mechanical telegraphy, like a radio teletype writer, that was around 50 bits per second in, during the Second World War, and it did never went above 100 bits per second. So this, uh, this communication is really slow over the ionosphere comparing to uh, today's standards. Uh, in fact, uh, exactly for this region, region is, reason is why multi-tone modems were invented. Multi, multi, first multi-tone multi modems around 1950, built by the military, reached 2,400 bits per second using several carriers, very inefficient transmitter. Uh, now, the, the technology came big steps forward with uh, digital signal processing, with fast Fourier transform, where we can make a multi-tone signal, multi-tone modulation rather easily, much easier than in 1950, where we needed huge boxes of electronics to generate this. For, but for the military, it's no problem. For the military, it's enough to have the communication. The cost is not a problem for the military. Now, uh, with uh, fast Fourier transform, we can do OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Uh, but uh, still, we, are, uh, we can raise our data rate. Uh, what we cannot do, we are very inefficient power-wise. 
power we use beta transmitter. Uh, but today we are not going about higher sig signaling rates, we are going to talk about signal fading. So the most important uh, reason of fading is this interference between different possible paths, between multi-path in the ionosphere. Besides multi-path, we have Faraday rotation. This uh, comes out of the gyromagnetic resonance, gyromagnetic resonance in the ionosphere because of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, because of Faraday rotation, the polarization on the receiving side is not much correlated to the polarization of the transmitter. So if you look at uh, uh, HF communications or shortwave, People do not pay almost any attention to, uh, attention to the polarization of the antennas because this Far Faraday rotation is huge. This Faraday rotation is a, in a typical ionosphere is maybe 100 times making the full circle if it was linear polarization. So this is, uh, this is a huge effect in shortwave. It uh, decreases with the square of frequency. So above 1 gigahertz is insignificant, but above 1 gigahertz we can no longer use uh, the ionosphere to uh, reflect waves back to the Earth. Uh, so, but the most important source is, uh, uh, for signal fading is uh, multipath. The second source is uh, Faraday rotation. And also, I said, the urinal variations like day and night, the ionosphere during day, the ionosphere during night. Then, uh, between day and night, we usually have to change frequencies uh, uh, to be used in the ionosphere. And of course, the receiver should have automatic gain control. And automatic gain controls were first invented really with shortwave receivers. As long as receivers were just using the direct wave from the transmitter without the ionosphere, uh, you could tune the receiver, adjust everything, and everything was fine. Uh, as uh, soon as the signal went to the ionosphere, the le signal level uh, started changing and the receivers, radio receivers, already in the Second World War, had to be equipped with an automatic gain control inside the receiver. This was also a side. Uh, this is maybe the historical reason where fading comes from, where signal fading comes from, but it is not the most, most important source today of fading. Uh, today, much, uh, we are much more concerned about fading uh, due to multipath in uh, mobile communications, say short range, relatively short range mobile communications. So we have a base station tower and we have a user with his radio. So what is here the problem? Here the problem is that we have many obstacles on this path. Like buildings, houses. So in our signal path we have maybe diffraction of, of here. I may have also reflections of here. Uh, we do not have uh, any dielectric, so we do not have a refraction. But diffraction and the re reflection are typical uh, sources of signal for our users. And so uh, the environment here is multiplied. Uh, so the signal will be change, changing quite, quite much at the user position. Also the user is moving, so the signal may change quite quickly. Uh, if we look here at the a wavelength of, say, uh, 33 centimeters, this is 900 megahertz, the mobile phone. Even when the user is walking around, 
here, here it's enough to ch uh, change the user. The user makes a complete cycle of multipad when uh, this reflection wave makes two pi circle. Since the path is doubled, this is it's enough to move for half a wavelength to go from one maximum to another maximum or for one minimum to another maximum. Or it's enough to go for a quarter wavelength to get from a maximum into the deepest possible minimum. So uh, multipad is here a real problem and that's the most, uh, most important source today uh, of studying fading, multipad fading. We also have this problem. And this is where, where fading comes important today. So uh, HF communication, short, uh, high frequency communication or short wave communication, today they are no longer that important. But this is, this is important business here, lots of money. My God. Then what we also have today, it's still there, though not that much used any longer. We may have between two mountains, we may have directional antennas for a point-to-point uh, -point microwave link. Uh, at a wavelength, uh, perhaps, microwaves are 3 centimeters. What do we have here? Here we have the problems with uh, changes in these microwaves due to weather effects. If we have rain, we may have absorption and we may have scattering of the microwaves being transmitted over this link. Uh, there are also other effects, not just rain. Here, rain was an example. But there are other effects, um, especially due to the geometry. The heights are much smaller than the horizontal distance. This is typical for our terrestrial links. Uh, we may have problems due to the uh, changing refractive index. Same, we may, see, we may have here, we may have something like uh, Inversion layer. Temperature inversion, where we have uh, uh, hot air or warm air, better, better to say warm air. And cold air below, so on uh, inversion we may have refraction. On rain, we may have scattering. We saw really scattering last time. We may have absorption. Now, uh, this is just to draw a few examples here on the board. Uh, now, uh, uh, what we have to do, we have to cope with all these problems due to the changing propagation conditions. Here, or here, or here. What we can do? Well, the first thing to do is to perform measurements. Measurements. Uh, and doing measurements, we are going to plot the received signal strength against the against time. So we have time here. We have the received signal strength uh, as a function of time. Where uh, what do I mean with this marking? Now this E is just uh, the received signal. Uh, which is vector sum, just its magnitude. Or, in other words, the whole 
vector here of the received signal has some direction uh, of polarization, has some uh, E, some uh, strength, and has some uh, phase angle. Some phase angle. And all this may be a function of time, but we are just interested in the signal strength. Because if we have signal strength, we can do something with the signal. If we do not have any strength of the signal, then there's nothing we can do. And uh, measuring this uh, signal strength as a function of time, we may get changes here. Now, uh, what we are really worried about here, we are worried that we get be below the minimum signal strength required by our receiver. So this is the minimum signal strength that still allows some reception. And what does that mean in practice? In practice, it means that I will have a uh, very short outage here, a much longer outage here, and a moderate outage here. Outage, so uh, my link drops out in these positions. This is what we can measure with the receiver. We install a recorder here and we record the signal strength here, or we record the signal strength here, or we record the signal strength here. Now, sometimes we can predict what is going to happen. Say with the ionosphere, we can uh, uh, predict whether it's day or night. So with the ionosphere, the sun is powering the ionosphere. with this shortwave ultraviolet radiation. It's uh, building the ionosphere. And uh, of course, we know approximately what is going to be, to be the difference between day and night. But it's not just day and night. That's the most easy thing to predict. Uh, with the ionosphere, there's also solar, solar activity. The number of, sun, of the sunspots number, uh, because uh, the sun is particularly active in radiating shortwave uh, radiation, so uh, ultraviolet and X-rays uh, in its sunspots. And this solar activity has the 11-year cycle. Eleven-year cycle. Uh, uh, there are also other things that may change here. Uh, the problem here is noise. Uh, things that may change is galactic noise. Or celestial noise, to better say. There are some particular regions in the sky that radiate more noise than the other. And at the relatively low frequencies, at 10 megahertz, that may be several hundred thousand Kelvin, changing the noise level. Uh, what may also change here is man made noise. This is also changing. And it is not affecting the signal strength, but it is affecting our signal-to-noise ratio. So it is affecting what we can actually do with such a link. Uh, in fact, we here maybe it was better not to measure just the received signal strength, but I want to simplify just with the signal strength here, my discussion. It was maybe better to measure actually the signal-to-noise ratio, uh, considering all effects, all effects also, all disturbing effects in our radio links. Now this is the result of our measurement. Uh, 
Uh, this result actually tells us, what it, tells us what is happening, but it is not telling us what to do about these things. So, uh, it is better to arrange the same measurement result in a kind of a histogram. where we have here the number of the events, number of times something happened, and here we have the signal strength. The signal strength written just as the magnitude. And we can group, and now drawing a histogram we have to select uh, the size of our columns here in the histogram. We have to select here now the, uh, here the width of these columns, so delta E. Uh, now, what can happen with the histogram? If, we, if I select a delta E that's too large, I'm not going to see much because these columns are going to be very large, maybe just a few, and I'm not going to see much about the signal. If I select this uh, column too narrow, I'm just going to see noise because here I'm actually working with a totally random variable like this receive signal strength. And I'm, if I select this delta E too narrow, I'm going to see lots of noise. So I have to be a little bit careful what is going to be the, the width of my columns uh, on the histogram. Now, on this same histogram, I could draw my limit. So, what is the minimum power E minimum to have a useful link? So, here it is working. And here I have an outage. Now, where is the problem with this reasoning here? The problem with this reasoning here is that here I have very few measurement results. It's only the area of this smallest rectangle here compared to the whole graph here. So most of the time I was losing my time actually measuring this, making these measurements. The customer, the user of my radio link is only going to uh, uh, ask what about this area here. Well, I've been measuring most of the time the link was working perfectly. And uh, how to make these calculations is, here I could simply count the number of occasions my link dropped out compared to the whole number, to the whole measurement time. And I can say, okay, my link drops out 0.01% of the whole total time. So now 0.01% means that I need at least 10,000 10, 10, measurements and just one of those 10,000 measurements is going to drop out for 0.01% probability. Uh, so this makes measurements very expensive. Uh, makes measurements very expensive and very impractical. We need lots of measurements and now we are thinking how to 
improved this thing how to make our calculations with the little uh, with the small amount of measurements uh, with a small amount of measurements uh, trying to obtain the same result out of here and what can we do here is actually to fit a mathematical curve mathematical curve. When I can obtain such a curve then it's simply to integrate the probability of the outage. Probability of the outage is just going to be this area under this region of the curve. Fitting of the mathem uh, mathematical curve that probably gives, uh, gives us some uh, density probability that I will have a certain electric field strength without phase, without polarization, just field, because if I have field I can solve something. So uh, our probability of the outage will now be equal to the integral from zero to the minimum required field strength, so this is outage, uh, probability, uh, this probability density P of E, this is a curve, times DE. And I can integrate to find this area, this surface down here, to find the probability of route outage. This is what I'm going to do. Now uh, the, uh, the problem is what kind of curve I am going to fit here. And actually this curve here needs a physical explanation. What kind of curve I am going to fit to this measurement data? Because uh, I have many different possible curves, many different mathematical functions, and it is not really straightforward now to see what, what is going to come out of this result. What kind of curve should I fit here? There are many different possible curves because uh, they need a physical explanation, and the physical explanation here is different than the physical explanation here, and it's different than the physical explanation here. So there are different physical effects causing signal fading, and therefore different uh, physical effects will give us different curves. And today we should look at the tricks, how to, how to fit the correct curve, or on one side to have get, getting the correct result for our outage of our link, for our dropouts, for the dropouts of our link, the probability of an outage. Or on the other hand, if our customer does not know much about physics, we can just be clever enough to select the correct curve uh, to tell our, uh, our customer that the link is going to work. We know it is not going to work. It's just to, to fool the, the customer. And uh, companies are doing this on several occasions. When people know nothing about the physics, you can just fit the wrong curve, show lots of math, lots of equations, everything looks fine, everything looks clever, uh, everything works. It's not going to work, but we have to sell the link, that's our problem. We have to actually sell our equipment, our antennas, our radios, and we have to prove the customer what the customer wants. So, so today I should also talk about the tricks, what is going on. So let's start with the most difficult uh, problem we have here. Uh, the most difficult and most attractive for us also is this mobile phone. And mobile phones make lots of money, so uh, it makes sense to investigate this thing. 
So what is actually going on here at the receiving side at the receiver? Uh, for a mobile phone. I'm going to, to analyze this. Uh, I should, if I'm plotting phases of the electric field, I should plot them in the complex plane. A real axis or I axis and imaginary axis or Q axis. We are, with signal processing, we are mainly uh, used to the I and Q designations. What is now our signal sum here? Here we have the sum of many small contribution. A small contribution from diffraction, a small contribution from reflection. There may be many, diff uh, many buildings contributing reflections, when there may be many buildings contributing refraction. So we have many such contributions. They are all small and they all have a an, uh, an completely random phase. All these small contributions and they do add up to a single received field. So this should be called ES. Received field. Still with, uh, I'm plotting it with the face inside. So uh, many small contributions. Uh, what can I say now about the received field, including the phase? So, if I write e received e of my signal, this is a complex quantity, this is a real quantity, A, E times J, V. Also, the phase angle is completely random here. Uh, I have such a sum of many small contributions. So now, I could say that my received field is now has a real part and uh, in an imaginary part. And both real and imaginary are completely random, but for real and imaginary, since they are a sum of, a completely random sum of, uh, 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 sum of phasers, uh, so both parts, I can write the probability density that I'm having a real part uh, as a Gaussian distribution. So the probability density will be Gaussian here, will be uh, sigma times square root of 2 pi. This is uh, just to normalize the Gaussian distribution. e to the minus uh, e real squared over 2 sigma squared. So the probability density will be Gaussian. A Gaussian probability density for the real part. I may think of exactly the same thing for the imaginary part. It's exactly the same. So probability density of the imaginary part is now 1 over sigma over square root of 2 pi. Uh, e to the minus uh, e imaginary squared to sigma squared. Both have the same sigma. Both distributions have the same sigma here. Why uh, the same sigma? Well, both, both effects are identical. I plug the same sigma for one as well for the other phase of, of the sigma. This is probability density, probability density that fits into the integral to integrate it over a certain interval to get the probability of the event. So now, uh, what am I going? I'm going to combine the, since these two, two are completely independent, uh, the, com uh, the common probability density so far to having a certain irreal and e imaginary now is what? It's just the product of the two. Probability density of the real part uh, multiplied by the probability density of the imaginary part. And this is now 
if I rewrite this thing, this is 1 over 2 pi sigma squared here, uh, e to the minus. And the multiple of two, uh, two exponent functions is uh, then exponent functions of the sum of the two exponents. So e real squared plus e imaginary squared over 2 sigma squared. Uh, since these two, uh, these two are statistically completely independent, the common probability density of the two is just the product of the single probability densities over here. Now let's think a little bit what do these number figures mean. So real part squared plus imaginary part squared this is just the electric field squared without the phase. So I can simplify this thing just plugging in here the actual electric field uh, without considering the phase. What is sigma? There is a sigma for real, there is a sigma for imaginary, both sigmas are the same. But the sigma is simply sigma squared uh, from the real part plus sigma squared of the imaginary part. This is just the average of the electric field squared. So this is just 2 sigma squared, which fits our equation quite ni nicely over here. <coughs> now what I'm interested, I'm not interested in particular event that has a particular E real and particular E imaginary. I'm only interested in the magnitude of our field. So uh, this probability on the other side is the same as the probability or having a particular E and a particular phase angle, probability density. So how to get P of E, which I needed here, probability density that just I have an electric field is to integrate over all possible phase angles which are random. This P of uh, E and phi, uh, D phi, okay? And if I do this, what I get out of here? Uh, I get just this uh, 2p cancelled over here. Just the 2p, just the 2p cancels out over here. Uh, so uh, if I just write, but uh, let let maybe uh, I just need, need a detail still here. I need a detail. Uh, so p of e, but uh, I have to multiply this. Not just the phi, I have to multiply, I have to use the same area. So the same area where integrated dA is maybe equal dE real times dE uh, imaginary. Or in polar coordinates, this is E times dE d phi. So I should multiply this here, this thing here by E, also by E. So trying to calculate this thing out, what is the probability density of E, is now rewriting this thing down. Uh, 0 to 2 pi cancels with this 2 pi here. I would prefer to have E squared down here, which is a known quantity. This can be easily deduced for, reduced from the measurements. From this curve, I can get uh, the average value of the square of my field. I can easily calculate it out. Uh, times, as I said here, e to the minus e squared up here, I replace it here. Uh, 2 sigma squared is just average value of the square of, square of the received field. And here I have, because this has this extra 2 in front, I need here two, twice time, 2 times e over here. I need to take half of this one here to get sigma squared. 
just half of this, and this half becomes 2 up here. So I get the probability density that I have just a single field. And this probability density is called the Rayleigh probability density. what I got out of here. So the Rayleigh probability density, what is important for us? We have actually the function to put in here into our integral. I put this function into my integral. And uh, if I know the average square field at my receiver, I can calculate the probability of the outage. I can do everything. Actually, what is interesting with the Rayleigh probability density is that this is the worst case, actually. Actually, it turns real in most times. This is the real expected result. We will see how to do things wrong next hour. But this is actually the real case, what we are going to see. So our probability, now it's capital P. For the probability, I'm using capital letters, capital P. For the probability density, I'm using lowercase letters. So it's now the integral from 0 to E minimum. Uh, this probability density I have here, 2E divided by square, uh, exponential function of E minus E squared divided by E. Average value is squared, uh, dE. I just rewrote the same equation. So now I have the formula here, how to calculate the probability of my outage. And actually, the Rayleigh distribution is the worst possible distribution. It actually gives us the highest probability of, of, of outage. What is the data I have to plug into this equation? It's two data I have to plug in. I have uh, the sensitivity of my receiver. So this is my receiver. And I have the average uh, received field E squared. So this was actually measured. This is a measured parameter. I plug it in here. I plug it in here. This I get from my measurements. I know what the average square field is. I know what the minimum required field by minor receiver is. So this is field. The actual field I plug in up here. Well, E is the integral variable. This integral is relatively easy to evaluate also um, analytically. So it's a simple integral. We'll see that next hour. Uh, for us, what is important is important that the Rayleigh probability, so the probability that our received field is just the sum of many small contributions, all about the same size, with a random phase. Uh, actually, this is actually the worst case. It gives us the highest probability of outage. We may be happy to get the mathematically correct results now, right now, but our customers may not be happy when uh, we are going to say them that our link is going to drop out. They don't like that. So we have to find a way how to fool our customers next hour.